Welcome to the Five Rivers Podcast. For more information, head to fiveriverschurch.com. We now join our services already in progress. Good morning, everybody. So glad to see you here. Can y'all stand up with me? Um, So for about five seconds before we actually start, I want us to shout as loud as we can, and I want us just to worship God and praise Him. So ready? I'm going to count to three, and I actually, I'm going to take out one of these so I can hear you because I can't hear you with these on. So on one, two, three. Hallelujah. Hallelujah! We worship you, God. You are worthy of all our praise. Hallelujah. We glorify you. We love you. And we are so thankful for you. Hallelujah. For this day, we're gathered in your name, calling out to you. Glory like a fire, awakening. I will burn our hearts with you. You're the reason. You're the reason we're here. You're the reason we're singing. So open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart. Filling every part of our praise. like a cloud you're standing with us now lord unveil our eyes you're the reason you're the reason we're here A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our praise. Show us, show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, we want to see you. Show us. Show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, Lord. Show us, show us your glory, show us, show us your power, show us, show us your glory, A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Open up the heavens, we want to see you. Open up the floodgates, a mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your power.
Show us your glory, Lord. Show us your glory. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Open, open, open up the heavens. We want to see you. Open up the floodgates. A mighty river flowing from your heart, filling every part of our brain. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, Lord. Let's sing it one more time. Show us, show us your glory. Show us, show us your power. Show us, show us your glory, We 
walking around these walls. I thought by now they'd fall. But you have never failed me yet. Waiting for change to come. Knowing the battle's won. For you have never failed me yet. Your promise still stands. Great is your faithfulness. Faithfulness. And still in your hands. This is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. And I know the night won't last, your word will come to pass. My heart will sing your praise again. Jesus, you're still enough. Keep me within your love. My heart will sing your praise again your promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never promise still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness i'm still in your hands this is my confidence you've never failed me still stands great is your faithfulness faithfulness I'm still in your hands 
This is my confidence, you've never failed. Your promise still stands, great is your faithfulness, faithfulness. I'm still in your hands, this is my confidence, you've never failed me yet. I've seen you move one more time. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. And I believe I'll see you do it again. You made a way where there was no way. And I believe I'll see you do it again. I've seen you move. You move the mountains. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over, my name is registered in heaven. I believe in signs and wonders. I have resurrection power. Still the miracle that I just can't get over My name is registered in heaven Yes, my praise belongs to you forever This is my testimony from death to life Cause grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony this is my testimony. Hallelujah. Come together, sons and daughters, bought with blood and washed in water. Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father. Our God will finish what He started. Oh, our God. We'll finish what he started. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. dead he's not done with us yet hallelujah if I'm not dead and you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done greater things are still to come oh I believe if I'm not dead and you're not done greater things are still to come Oh, I believe, if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe, if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe, if I'm not dead, then you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe.
This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous. I'm justified. This is my testimony. Oh, I'm alive. This is my testimony from death to life. Cause grace rewrote my story. I'll testify. By Jesus Christ the righteous, I'm justified. This is my testimony. This is my testimony. Oh. This is my testimony. Hallelujah. That is our testimony this morning. Amen. 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 Go ahead and greet one another this morning. Say hello, shake a hand, hug a neck. Tell them God loves them this morning as we move into our morning announcements. Good morning and welcome to our service today. A reminder that we have launched our new Five Rivers app and you can download it now. Check out our website, fiveriverschurch.com for a tutorial of the new features. Heather Dotson is sponsoring a blood drive with the Blood Bank of Delaware here at Five Rivers on Saturday, October 2nd from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. If you are interested in scheduling an appointment, you can call the blood bank at 888-8-BLOOD-8 or go to delmarvablood.org. There are posters around the building with the information on it. We will be preparing a meal for the folks at the Paris Foundation on Sunday, October 3rd. If you are available, please join us right after the morning service to help with our assembly line of preparing sandwiches and filling the bags for each of the meals. Family Fun Fest is coming up on Saturday, October 30th. We have our display in the foyer where you can put your candy and other donations. Also, our volunteer sign up board is ready and waiting for your signatures. If you have any questions about what we need or how you can volunteer, someone will be in the foyer to help you today. Remember to make sure there are no Halloween images on the candy wrapping. Fall is here and God has plenty for us to do. So don't let your heart be troubled or afraid. God bless. Amen. Amen. Any peeps here that along with me, you're enjoying the cooler weather? Wave at me. Yes, amen. I've got some friends here. I got some folks that don't want to hear anything about cooler weather, right? <laughs> That's for sure. Hey, I was just thinking during our time of worship uh, about this question. So what's today? Today is uh, September 26th, right? So let's just make it real time. How many here, or you're participating uh, through the live stream, you would say that in one of our services or at any point this month, God has spoken to you, ministered to you, helped you, strengthened you in any capacity. Wave at me. Yeah, amen. Look at that. You know what that says? If you looked around, as God is on the move, He's still God. He's still amazing, doing amazing things. Now, how many would like to see what God's doing in your life do, do some of the same things in other people's lives? Amen. So I was just thinking, you know, I haven't done this in a while, but uh, these little cards here in the pew backs in front of you, they're not pew decorations. All right? Take these things, put them in somebody's hand, or uh, we still have plenty of these door hangers. Do a prayer walk in your neighborhood. See, you don't have the excuse of hot, humid weather now, right? So these are in the lobby. Just do a prayer walk through your neighborhood. Hang these on the door. 
uh, people can take their phones and scan this little QR code. There's a video message there, a greeting from me uh, to let them know someone's prayed over them from our church. And then we've got these nice little guys here. We're going to order more. Uh, invite someone to coffee or as we're doing on Wednesday nights, just walk across the room. Just find meaningful ways to connect with folks and say, hey, you can join us online or uh, come and see for yourself. Would you be willing to do that? And uh, just, just watch God do the incredible. Isn't that what we're after? And, and to, to experience what we sang about this morning and many other mornings. Well, listen, we've got one more video for you. Calling all men. Uh, the men's conference is coming up here in, in just three weekends, October 15 and 16. And I look forward to being there. Uh, there's plenty of space on the sign-up sheet out there. Guys, we'd love to have you come. If you've never come, you know, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll make you a deal. If you'll come and you didn't enjoy it, I will personally refund your fee. All right? Uh, but if you go and God speaks to you, then walk in what He speaks to you. Enjoy the fellowship with other men from our congregation and what God speaks to you. So just one more video announcement here today. Uh, hopefully to encourage our men to sign up and come on out and join us. My wife just said to me, you guys going to be doing all these things? I said, I hope so. <laughs> I want to, come on, who wants to jump out of a perfectly good airplane with me? Right? Sign me up. I, I would try that. No? Well, how about men? Any men here just want to jump and go skydiving? Well, that'd be a great men's outing. A little skydiving trip. Right? I see Bill's getting the business over here. I'd, I'd like to listen in on that conversation, wouldn't you? <laughs> That's for sure. All right, I guess we better get down to business, get into the word that God has for us today. Listen, in our, in our what's this called? A series. In our series on Christ and culture, uh, the message today is entitled, Replace the Cycle. Replace the cycle, that'll make more sense to you as, as we go along. You've heard me quote a friend of mine uh, from Boston, Dr. Greg Detweiler, a number of times in recent days where he says, in Western culture, we have a poor theology of suffering. Last week, we really started talking about suffering and how to manage that and steward it. Uh, here's an image on, on the screen. You, you remember... You remember this image from just a few years ago when the ISIS members beheaded the Egyptian Christians on a beach in Libya, right? But I will never forget Greg when, when we had him in showing a video clip of Egyptian Christian mothers, the mothers of these men lined up on the beach that were beheaded, and they were forgiving there's video records of them forgiving and praying for the ISIS members that beheaded their sons back in 2015. I can tell you these men, their mothers, would have absolutely no concept of the American version of the so-called prosperity gospel. Nowhere in their minds would that register. Much better theology of suffering than most American Christians. It's been noted that hurt people hurt people. In other words, in this context, if, 
If someone is hurt or offended, then a hurtful or offensive uh, retaliation is sought. So, in other words, revenge becomes the order of the day. Uh, too many today want, want to retort personally and or uh, take to, to social media platforms. Wow! You want to say that with me? Wow! Wow, has social media ever revealed some dark spaces in the soul's recesses? Now, along the idea of revenge that we just mentioned a moment ago, the idea of revenge is, you hurt me, so now I want to hurt you. I, I'm suffering because of you, so now I want you to suffer because of me. So inadvertently what we do is, is, is now we, we pass on adverse behavior to others from that which has adversely affected us. Have you noticed that in the flesh, this ugly flesh, that, that we have this propensity, we, we have this bent to respond or to behave in kind. But in the spirit, the apostle Paul he did not react in kind, did he? His response to suffering has now become a part of God's eternal word to us. In 2 Corinthians, we've, we established this last Sunday. In 2 Corinthians, Paul is he's writing out of intense pain from a deeply hurtful situation. So what had happened is, is a visit to Corinth did not go as hoped and according to plan. Let me ask you this. Has this ever happened to you? Uh, maybe at a funeral, right? Uh, I got word I wasn't here for it, but uh, just a few weeks ago, an outside organization uh, rented our facilities for a funeral, and the report got to me. Uh, someone had to be removed from the kitchen over a food, Right? Or how about, how about a family reunion? You ever gone to a family reunion and, yeah, that didn't work out maybe as good as you had hoped or planned. Listen, just last week, maybe you saw or read the report as I did, I, I read of, of a shooting at a baby shower over gifts. What should have been a joyous occasion turned sour and harmful. Now listen, there was a baby shower <laughs> scheduled here after the service. I greatly anticipate a much better report on this one. How does that sound? <laughs> I hope so, too. I trust so. Right? Listen, many, if not all, in the church at Corinth that Paul was writing to was probably saved because of Paul's ministry in some capacity. They had a local church, didn't they, because of Paul's labors in the Lord that he had started on his second of three missionary journeys. In the truest sense of the word, Paul was these people's spiritual father, wasn't he? So you can probably imagine the, the hurt in his heart when, when they question his motive over wanting to take a collection to help the needy in Jerusalem. They added salt to the wound when they challenged his authority as an apostle because of the ministry hardships that he faced in fulfilling his calling. And then the, the continued opposition against him after he had left. Let me ask you, what do you think you would have done in, in a situation like this? Thank God. Here's what Paul did. Paul broke the vicious cycle of hurt people, hurt people, and he began a virtuous cycle of hurt people, help people. You see, you, you, you see here and you read this and you understand that in his heart, Paul wanted to go back to Corinth for a follow-up visit, but he thought better of it. You know, how many knows it's a good thing to put your mind in gear before you put your mouth in motion, Right? He wanted to go back, he wanted to do a follow-up visit, but he thought better of it. So look here, we pick up in, in 2 Corinthians, the end of chapter 1 that takes us into the beginning of chapter 2 where Paul writes, I call God as my witness. 
and I stake my life on it, that it was in order to spare you that I did not return to Corinth. Not that we lorded over your faith, but we work with you for your joy, because it is by faith you stand firm. So I made up my mind that I would not make another painful visit to you. For if I grieve you, who is left to make me glad but you whom I have grieved? I wrote as I did so that when I came, I would not be distressed by those who should have made me rejoice. I had confidence in all of you that you would share all of my joy. For I wrote you out of great distress and anguish of heart and with many tears, not to grieve you, but to let you know the depth of my love for you. Now, what is Paul doing here? He's beginning with the end in mind. So, he has a thought, he looks ahead, and he's like, okay, this is where this could go. So he begins with the end in mind, and he changes his mind. And then back in chapter 1, verse 14, we see really beginning with the ultimate end in mind when he wrote this verse. He says, I, I, and I hope that, as you have understood in part, you will come to fully understand that you can boast of us just as we will boast of you, and here it is, in the day of the Lord Jesus. It's the ultimate end, right? So the idea of beginning with the end in mind, which here it incorporates considering others and the day that we stand before Jesus, and, and the idea of that, it changes things, a lot of things, all right? And one of those things is, is now you want to exchange revenge with reconciliation, Oh, this can be so hard, right? It can be hard because, let's be honest, getting revenge opens a floodgate of adrenaline that makes you feel so alive, doesn't it? But see, here's the problem. That which makes you feel most alive in your flesh can bring the most death to your spirit. In the context of today, oh yes, you, you can get great revenge, but it comes at the cost of a vital relationship. It comes with the high price of, of more division and more hurt in the situation. Listen, if I'm right in the flesh, I win. But if I'm right in the spirit, we win, right? In 2 Corinthians, what was Paul doing here? He's now generating the virtuous cycle of we win. We see that he began with the end in mind, but next he gives us a key ingredient to sustain the journey or to sustain the virtuous cycle. In other words, until we reach the end. You know what that key ingredient is? It's forgiveness for the offender. Verses 5 and 6. If anyone has caused grief... He has not so much caused grief to me as he has grieved all of you to some extent, not to put it too severely. The punishment inflicted on him by the majority is sufficient. So in the previous section of this letter, Paul has spoken about feeling pain, causing pain, and avoiding further pain. And now all three aspects recur here in verses 5 through 11 that we're going to go through with reference to a certain wrongdoer in the church at Corinth. Now particularly apparent in this passage is Paul's sensitivity as a pastor. And, and we see that in, in really in what we don't see in verses 5 through 8 in that he avoided in naming the individual. In this case, now in other cases, he did name them, didn't he? But in this case, he avoids naming the individual. And in addition, or secondly, he recognizes that Christian discipline is not simply punishment. But it's also correction toward a cure, as we see in verses 6 and 7. 
And then we see that he indirectly appeals to his own conduct as an, as an example for the Corinthians to follow. That's in verse 10. And then lastly, Paul is fully aware of the divisive intention and operation of Satan within the Christian community. We're going to see that in a few moments in verse 11. So the majority at the church in Corinth had expressed their, their repentance by punishing the leader of the rebellion against Paul. Paul now calls upon them to follow his own Christ-like example uh, toward them by extending mercy to the offender. Why? Lest Satan would once again find his way into their hearts and into the church at Corinth. Now let's break this passage down a little more. So in verse 5, we evidently see that after Paul's painful visit, an insult had been directed toward him by someone in the church who had headed up, headed up an opposition to the apostle. And they had objected to uh, Paul's disciplinary methods, such as those that, that were outlined back in 1 Corinthians chapter 5. But here in 2 Corinthians, Paul now discounts the sorrow that had been caused by him uh, in this unfortunate, or caused to him, excuse me, by this unfortunate episode. So verse 5 could flesh out to read this way. Listen, if anyone has caused pain, he's caused pain not so much to me as to all of you to some extent not to exaggerate a point. Verse 6 Paul here counsels the church to terminate the discipline that was determined by the majority toward the individual in question. Now next, not only were they to stop a negative that the devil could use, but start a positive that God could use. Look here, verses 7 and 8. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Now, verses 7 and 8 clearly seem to indicate that repentance and even sorrow had taken place in the offender. Don't we wish that was always the case? That's not always the case, is it? But in this case, there's an indication that repentance and even sorrow had taken place uh, in, in the heart of the, the offender. So now, instead of continuing to punish, the Corinthians ought to shift their efforts toward restoration with forgiveness and comfort. That's what's going on here in this passage. Well, that lines up with other places in God's Word, even Corinthians. We learn we are called to the ministry of reconciliation. And, and when this, this reformation is the goal, a reaffirmation of love with forgiveness and encouragement, that becomes a part of the means to reach the goal. Now, a great benefit to this is is when it is successful, what does it do? It reassures the, wrong, the wrongdoer who is repentant the reality of divine forgiveness. Hey, is there anybody here today who is thankful that God has in fact forgiven you? I am. Anybody here, you're just not thankful, you're all upset, your life's a mess because God has forgiven you. Right? Or how many could say, my life is better because God has forgiven me? We pick up in verse 9 of 2 Corinthians. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive. I have forgiven in the sight of Christ 
for your sake. In order that Satan may not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. So, verse 9 that we just read shows that that a positive response to this instruction would afford Paul's evidence or, or would afford Paul evidence of the church's willingness to acknowledge his divinely given authority as an apostle to the church in removing discipline as much as it was to administer discipline as he had instructed in earlier days. In verses 10 and 11, Paul here aligns himself with the believer's decision to forgive. All right? And it's a decision that he trusts that they are going to make after they receive his letter that we know is 2 Corinthians. You know what Paul is in effect saying here? That, that your verdict of forgiveness is in effect also my verdict of forgiveness. Or in other words, anyone who has your forgiveness, they have mine too. But Paul does hasten to add here, that he has already forgiven the person. It was Paul who had taken the initiative in this matter of forgiveness. You know what he's doing here now and in incorporating others? He's adding momentum. He's adding strength to a virtuous cycle here. You see, there was a need for Paul's personal forgiveness. And he said that in Christ, in other words, he was able to, in Christ, give deference to the penitent offender's feelings and discount, discount the personal pain that he experienced. We saw that in verse 5, right? And he understands the seriousness of the offense in verse 10. Now, the circumstances of Paul's forgiveness are then defined in verses 10 and 11. First... Forgiveness was granted, what's he say here, in the sight of Christ. Isn't that what he said? You know what this does? This shows that Jesus was looking on. How many knows Jesus is watching? He sees what's going on in his church. He sees and he knows what's going on in your life. So this, this shows and understand by, by writing this that Jesus was, was looking on as a witness, and he approved. He approved of forgiveness. I think this makes sense. For it was Jesus that, who taught us that willingness to forgive one's brothers or sisters in Christ, it was a precondition for us to receive divine forgiveness. You see that in Matthew chapter 12. You see it again in Matthew chapter 18. And then it's in Colossians chapter 3, verse 13, where Paul grounds the Christian obligation to forgive others on the Christian's experience of God's forgiveness for them in Christ. Now, furthermore, forgiveness was granted for the welfare of the believers in the Corinthian church. Come on, we just read it. What did he say? For your sake. Paul wrote here, for your sake, what's he trying to do here? He's trying to preserve their unity by bringing closure to this whole episode that had happened. This would have also relieved them of any embarrassment for not having acted against the offender before Paul wrote to them. And we do see later in chapter 7, we'll see this in a few weeks, they did feel a sense of disloyalty to Paul. You see that coming out. But then verse 11 shows us this additional reason why forgiveness should be granted. Here it is. To avoid being outwitted by the master evil strategist, Satan. All right? Listen. The devil is absolutely bent on, on creating discord within the church. And in, in the case at Corinth, it was between the repentant wrongdoer and his fellow Christians. You've heard me say this before, but I'm going to say it again in this context. The devil doesn't care which side of the road he gets you in the ditch. 
all right? Whether it's, it's by the sin of offending or the sin of not forgiving the offender. So to withhold forgiveness when this man was in fact repentant, would have been to play in the hand of Satan, who had already gained one advantage when the man had sinned. Hear me. In the church, we should never reach the point where punishment or discipline is vindictive. And, and suffering would drive the repentant individual to despair. So Christian discipline should be administered in love, shouldn't it? In love with what? The goal of reform. Why? Because it, it, it aims at reinstatement after repentance is, is, is there through forgiveness and reconciliation. Now, one of the keys here is that the guy was repentant. You're saying, okay, pastor, what about, what about the one that's not repentant? Well, let's touch on that. And, and, and I would say this, whether they're repentant or not, forgiveness and reconciliation it doesn't, doesn't have to mean that you now become best friends in your family's vacation together, okay? And, and you know what? There may be a time and a season in certain situations, departure is the way to go. And, and whether that person is repentant or not, you and I should grant forgiveness so it, it may mean some things. It, it, it may not mean that you become best friends in your family's uh, vacation together, but I can tell you forgiveness certainly does mean this. It means that you are now freed to be in right relationship with the one who's forgiven you. And trust me, you want that freedom. It's a wonderful place to be able to live and be. Now, in verses 12 and 13, Paul touches on some recent times and We'll pull from other places, but it, it says here, Now, when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, I still had no peace of mind because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Now, with different passages of Scripture... We're able to put them together and reconstruct the events leading up to the sending of, some have called 2 Corinthians the suffering letter, all right? Or others, some others have called 2 Corinthians the letter of tears. We just read it a few moments ago. Paul says, I write this with just much anguish and, and in tears. So many have called it the letter of tears that, that Paul sent with Titus to Corinth as he himself stayed back in Ephesus, which is where, where Paul went after that painful, painful experience that he had suffered in Corinth. So here we have this attempt at ministry in Troas, and, or Troas, and it was diminished as, as Paul was restless in his spirit. He writes here, I had no peace of mind. Now, this was also because of a number of other circumstances, like I said, that, that we can piece together from various places in Scripture and, and reconstruct. And, and some other things that come into play here was, was the disheartening opposition at, at Ephesus, which caused a premature departure there. All right, sometimes you, you got to leave prematurely. It's better overall for you and, and for the other people involved in a situation. Also, there was this, this persistent uncertainty in Paul's heart and his spirit. There was this persistent concern over what had happened in Corinth. And boy, the painful situations have a way of just keep coming back. And you think you get over it and something triggers it again and again and again and again and again, right? And, and Paul is, is suffering from that, this, this uncertainty of, and concern over what happened there. And then there was concern over Titus' safety because... Uh, they, they, he didn't meet up with Paul where they were supposed to meet at a prescribed time. Let me ask you, do you feel like you can identify with Paul? Maybe at least a little bit. It, it, it's not just one or two or three things even. No, no, it's, it's that compound effect of 22 things, isn't it? 
but hold on. It's about to get better. Somebody say better. Who likes better? I like better. Better's good, right? See, the next session begins a digression brought about Paul's remembering his happy reunion in Macedonia with Titus, who in fact brought encouraging news now from Corinth. And boy, that was a relief to Paul. Just a great relief in his spirit. In the favorable reaction to the letter of tears reported by Titus, Paul now was able to see God's vindication of his apostleship and, and a triumph of God's grace in the heart of the Corinthians. We pick up in verse 14. But thanks be to God, who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal procession. And uses us to, to spread the aroma of the knowledge of Him everywhere. For we are God's pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved and those who are perishing. To the one we are an aroma that brings death. To the other an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the Word of God for profit. On the contrary, in Christ, we speak before God with sincerity as those sent from God. So here, in spite of temporary frustrations and sufferings, Paul now is likening, if you're a history buff, particularly Roman history, Paul, is, Paul likens the, the difficult advance of the gospel to the lavish Roman victory processions after they won a battle. You see, when the Romans were victorious, the general, along with all of his soldiers, would lead in a triumphal procession, right? And and then behind them in, in chains, locks and chains, would be their prisoners, their, their captives who are in tow, and now they're subject not only to defeat but to public ridicule, right? Now, Paul here, if you understand this, he sees himself and his fellow ministers not as these exultant soldiers who share in their uh, general's victory procession, but as willing, right? joyful captives who counted a privilege to be a part of God's triumph and as proclaimers of their generals, Jesus, right, his victorious strength at work in their lives. But hear me today, you cannot make a triumphant procession into the next season of your life if you're still a defeat from the last one. Living in the past will kill your future, all right? Now, since on the road to Damascus, when he surrendered to Jesus, Paul had been in captive union with Christ for the cause of Christ. And, and he's been part of this triumphal procession of Christ, even through some difficult and sometimes painful advancement of the gospel. See, now we've seen both sides, haven't we? Which is a recurring theme through 2 Corinthians and that's the, the contrast of the believer's apparent temporal defeat and the believer's actual spiritual victory. Thus, Paul's sufferings for the cause of Christ spreads everywhere. We just read it. Spreads everywhere the fragrance, the, the aroma of the knowledge of Him. You see, fragrance is that which comes from the inside when you squeeze the outside. Moonlight breeze. Come on, who wouldn't want a good whiff of some moonlight breeze? All right. That smell, would, it, would this side like a shot? Hopefully nobody in here is allergic. How... You feeling left out over here? Yeah, all right. Since you had to wait to last, 
you get too, right? Well, see, fragrance is what comes out of the inside when you squeeze from the outside, isn't it? Now, Moonlight Breeze, this stuff smells pretty good. Should have seen me at Redner's yesterday, you know, sampling, right? The different. Now, I didn't see them on the shelf next to where the Febreze was, but I understand there's some other fragrances that are out there that might not be as refreshing and enjoyable as, boy, it smells good up here, as, as Midnight as midnight breeze. You see, it was through a lot of suffering in Paul's life that the fragrance, the aroma of the knowledge of Christ was spread. Yeah. And see, in, in verses 15 and 16, Paul moves here from, from the fragrance associated with, with, with the triumph of a Roman procession to the aroma that, that is associated with the Old Testament sacrifices. You see it in Genesis chapter 8, Exodus chapter 29, again in Leviticus chapter 1. You see, we are to God the aroma of Christ among believers and unbelievers alike. And as Christ followers, our lives should diffuse a sweet fragrance up before the Lord in the way we live our lives. It's a fragrance of Christ that rises up and our lives become a pleasing aroma to God. You see, irrespective of human response to the gospel, its proclamation delights God's heart. Why? Because it centers on His Son. It centers on His Son, whom He loves so much. Irrespective, or, or I, I should say, we're, we're seeing today the, the outworking of verse 16 more than any other time in our lives. And that is those who are Christ followers. We, we get to enjoy God's redemptive blessings and goodness in our lives, right? Everybody doing all right with the fragrance? Anybody need a mask? You're right. See, we're seeing the outworking of verse 16 more than any other time in our lives. Those who are Christ followers enjoy God's redemptive blessings and goodness. And, but those who are not saved, and they're, they're spiritually dead. Here it is. They're just repulsed more than ever by Jesus and the privileges that are available to, to the saved. But he, and, and here's the thing that distinguishes these two groups. We see it in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10. This is, the, this, this is what distinguish, the, distinguishes the two groups. It's love for the truth of the gospel or hatred for the truth of the gospel. Hear me today. Life results from a positive response to the gospel. Death results from a negative response. You see that in John chapter 3, verse 36. One aspect of, of the potency of the cross is, is its power to, to attract and convert those who are repentant and repulse and harden those who remain unrepentant. You see, only those who are surrendered, repentant, and commissioned are up to the task of representing Christ and proclaiming the good news, not those who peddle an adulterated message for personal gain. Paul appeals to the sincerity of his motives and the purity of his message here. And, and this was shown when, when, by his divine commission when he wrote these words, like men sent from God. God has sent me to you, is what he's saying. I've been sent here from God to speak in to your lives the areas that need spoken to. So he's showing his divine commission here. He also shows his, his sense of divine dependence and responsibility when he wrote these words, In Christ we speak before God. Not just in your hearing, he hears, he knows. And then he adds... Or we see here, he shows his divine 
authority, and power when he wrote the words, in Christ. The principle is clear. As those who dispense the life-giving remedy for sin, those who proclaim the gospel must avoid diluting or adulterating the medicine of life, which is the Word of God. And this holds true in both word and deed. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ here today, and Brian, would you please come? I want to encourage you today. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you are sent from God. Just as Paul was, just as I am, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you too are sent from God to speak truth, to speak life into death. You, you are sent from God to speak light and be light in dark situations that your life takes you. If, if you are a follower of Christ, you are sent from God to bring hurt, I mean, excuse me, help and healing into the hurt. You are sent from God to bring forgiveness into offense. You are sent from God to bring promise into the problem. You are sent from God to bring hope into the the happenings of your life, no matter where your life takes you. And just like Paul, in Christ, it shows both our dependence and our, our dependence on Him and our authority in Him. Isn't that why He calls and sends bondservants? Because of men's brokenness. Oh, and there is so much brokenness today. He, he calls and sends bond servants because of, of men's brokenness, even when, when their hang-ups and hiccups and mess-ups and throw-ups land on you. Forgiveness is a big deal here. It's a very big deal. It's a key ingredient in replacing the cycle. It's a key ingredient in, in getting rid of a vicious cycle in your life and generating a virtuous cycle in your life. Can I tell you that nothing, will, and there's a lot of things, but, but nothing will help you break out of a vicious cycle more than forgiveness. And nothing will help you to step in and generate a virtuous cycle more than forgiveness. So let me ask you, with anyone today, in any capacity, is forgiveness in order in the house of the Lord today? And, and maybe it's, it's forgiveness for others. Forgiveness for others. Or... How about this? Forgiveness for yourself. Anybody here struggle with yourself sometimes as the hardest person to forgive? Yeah. Or maybe it's a combination of the two. Listen, here's what I know. You can make no connections. You can make no connects with unforgiveness and God's best in your life. So my wife's going to help me here. If you could just hold out God's word like this. Okay, so this hand represents unforgiveness, okay? This hand represents God's best for you. Who wants God's best for you? Do you want God's best for you? I think it's pretty evident God wants his best for you. He's given us his written word. He's given us, and she's thinking, hurry up because my arm's getting tired. I hope you hold it up here, right? Listen, it's on the screen. You can make no connects of unforgiveness and God's best for you. You can't do it. Oh, we try to burrow under we try to reach around God's word, God's way. We try to get over on it. 
But if this is really our rule for faith and conduct, you can make no connects between unforgiveness and God's best for you. You got to forgive. You got to implement His best, His word. One of the key things that Paul wrote here is, hey, I wanted to test you to see if you would be obedient in everything. We just read it a few moments ago, right? Wow, who put that there? Yeah. I wanted to see if you'd pass the test. I wanted to see if you'd obey the whole thing. We referenced it a moment ago. There is no one in their right mind that can ever question, does God want his best for you? He does. But if you want his best, you've got to follow his plan. It's the way it works. I wonder today, and, and it, maybe it's not even forgiveness, but it's, it's with something else going on in your life, and you just, you're caught up in a vicious cycle. And it's draining you, and it's causing doubt or, re, or bitterness or resentment or, or going another direction, chasing after this or whatever. And you're just stuck in a vicious cycle. God's Word says, hey, you, you can break out of that vicious cycle, and you, be, you can begin a virtuous cycle. So whether it's forgiveness or something else, I'm going to ask you to be bold today. Jesus was so bold, he hung, on, he hung naked on a cross for you and for me. But how many here today would say, Pastor, God's word has spoken to me. I want to obey it. There's some, I'm in some cycles where there's some viciousness, but I want to break out of that. I want to begin some virtuous cycles. Do you need to forgive anybody at any, at any capacity today, including yourself? Listen, don't try to set yourself up as a higher tribunal of God in regards to yourself. Some of you here today, maybe you just need to forgive yourself for some things to help get you out of the, the vicious into the virtuous. But anyone here that says, you know, I, I need God's help. I, I want to be like that offender. I want to receive God's word. I want to be repentant. I want to take on God's best word. Come on, right now, let's just begin to stand all over this sanctuary. It's today is replacement day. All right? Today is a day of replacement. In your heart, in your spirit, in your life, in your actions, in your reactions. Today, we're going to replace the cycle with God's help. We can't do it on our own. We cannot do it on our own. We've got to have His help. Or as Paul wrote, in Christ. In Christ. As, Bl or as Brian plays and sings all over, can we just turn the house of the Lord into a house of prayer? And if anyone would like to have someone to pray with you or for you personally... I'm going to ask you to step down and uh, come around this altar. If you want to pray alone, you can come or stay where you are. But if you want someone to pray with you through these moments together, these closing moments, I'm going to ask you to step down right now. Today is Replace the Cycle Day. And I believe that the presence of the Lord is in this place. And He's going to take you, help you to step out of a, a vicious cycle into a virtuous cycle. And there's new life. There's greater things ahead. Come on. Anyone else, step down right now if you want someone to pray with you. Let's trust the Lord together. Let's sing. So let our voices rise. And all creation cry. Singing out an endless hallelujah from this moment on. Join with heaven's song, singing out an endless hallelujah. Let our voices rise, 
all creation cries, singing out an endless Alleluia. From this moment on, join with heaven's song, singing out an endless Alleluia. Only a moment to live this life like shooting stars burning up the night till heaven's open and we arrive in your presence lord in your presence only a moment to live this life like shooting stars burning up the night till heaven's open we arrive in your presence lord in your presence only a moment to live this life like shooting stars burning up the night till heaven's open we arrive in your presence lord in your presence we'll let our voices rise all creation cries singing out an endless alleluia from this moment on join with heaven's song singing out an endless alleluia voices rise all creation cries singing out an endless alleluia from this moment on join with heaven's song singing out an endless alleluia there's nothing better there's nothing better, there's nothing better than this right now, now. There's nothing better, there's nothing better, there's nothing better than this right now, now. Let our voices rise, all creation cries, singing out an endless Alleluia from this moment on. Join with heaven's song, singing out an endless Alleluia. So while some are praying throughout the sanctuary, if you want to be dismissed, would you please slip out quietly while others are praying and letting the Holy Spirit minister to them? And can I remind you to see if you can bring somebody with you next Sunday, amen? It's going to be another good day in the house of the Lord. God bless you. Have an awesome week.
If you've never visited us at Five Rivers, we want to invite you to this week's services with ministry for the entire family. For location information, visit us online at fiveriverschurch.com.